Hey everybody, it's Tim with Broken Dice. I'm going to bring you on this little channel update my uh, review of the uh, Clash of Empire rule set by Great Escape Games. <laughs> Okay, everybody, let me uh, start off with the battlefield setup. Now, uh, if anybody's watched the battle reports that I were putting up, uh, you notice the uh, deck of cards being used. That has nothing to do with the rule set. It is not in the rule set. I used that because I was playing a solo game, and I wanted to have a lot more, uh, well, let's say, less control over what's going on, so I couldn't skew everything the way that... Uh, my internal bias would probably want the game to go. So let's get into this battlefield setup. Um, what I like about it, it kind of takes into historical kind of context the um, the aggressiveness of the of the armies at the time. Uh, it takes into consideration their their vitality, their uh, expansionism, and that sort of thing. And that's why at this at this point in time, when I use the Archimedes uh, Persians, at that point in time in history, when I was using army, they were very dynamic, they were expansionist, uh, they were um, head and shoulders above everything else in the Mediterranean at the time. And that's why their strategy rating was so much higher than the Greek rating at the time. The Greeks were a little bit expansionary but not as dynamic as the as the Persians were at the time um, they had a lot of um, uh, city-states along the Aegean coast and stuff but uh, they were not expanding into the interior uh, and they were less unified at the time too so that's why the strategy rating thing comes into play and it changes over time because of the later periods, the uh, the Persian strategy rating goes down and the Greek strategy rating goes up all the way to the time of Alexander when it really flips back and forth to where the, uh, the Greek Macedonian-led Greeks uh, have a higher strategy rating than the Persian Empire does. Let's look at a couple things I like. I like the, the, the strategy rating I like some of the modifiers that go into it. Those are the things with the little stars next to it. Um, kind of um, lets your army composition help. Like historically, like if you had a lot more cavalry, like you had a lot of mobility, you were able to to uh, have battlefield intelligence and uh, be able to you know keep track of your foe, as it were. And the fact that you know, and and then the uh, the winner of this. Um, kind of uh, calculation of uh, strategy rating and who gets the initiative and get you know they get to choose the climate which is basically kind of like the way your home turf is uh, you can choose to fight on somebody else's turf or you can pick one of your own so um, and I would assume that in some ways that may benefit some armies that uh, uh, more so than others through history probably does um, in my solo game uh, if you notice I mean I put the numbers up here that when I rolled this stuff out you can see that the, the Persian strategy rating was so much higher and uh, <clears throat> that's why um, uh, things were were done the way they were at the very bottom, I, I, I mentioned that I added die three cards to, for each turn to 
choose kind of an initiative. I didn't strict stick strictly with the uh, uh, I went first this turn, then I go first the next turn, and then in the phases things go back and forth. But this way, I wanted to to have um, a lot less control over that sequence of gameplay. Uh, it worked out okay. It worked out okay. But that is the reason why I added the extra strategy cards for the uh, the Persian army throughout the entire uh, the entire uh, battle report. Okay, choosing terrain. Now, there's 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 a couple of things here. Uh, if you choose like um, let's say like I chose for my game, uh, fertile. That means a lot of fields. You have to choose one of those. You know, you have to choose one, and then there, then there are the rest of the generic stuff. But there are also a list of things that you can't bring. Uh, I'm not so sure I'm much of a fan of that. But I can understand where some, you know, gross exaggerations could could play out. You don't want to put a jungle theme in, you know, Greeks and Persians, but you know you you do have to have some sort of idea of what the terrain was and try to uh, get as close as possible. But too many limitations, like on, on the one with the, the, the fertile, um, there was no impassable terrain. Well, I'm not sure that that's really endemic of all fertile places on the planet. I mean, there have got to be some impassable terrain around in, in Greece or the Persian Empire at the time. But, you know, and the size, the size of the terrain pieces and, um, you know, that's kind of uh, standard stuff. You don't want your terrain pieces too big or too many of them on the table. It skews the game. Uh, where the star is, the terrain can be moved or removed after setup. I kind of like that idea. I do kind of like that idea. It gives it gives like a, if someone's kind of being a little cheeky and choosing their best terrain pieces and there you know there is an option that uh, one player can remove a piece of terrain altogether from the table if they roll right. There's there's a section on that. I'm not going to go that deep of a dive into each section. I'm just going to give you an idea of whether I liked it or not and it, it was okay I mean it's I didn't particularly do this because I set the train up in a very kind of um, um, systematic way where it was kind of the same on both sides because I didn't want one side to have too much of an advantage over the other with it you know I didn't want to do like a uh, a Thermopylae where I set my Greeks up right in the middle of the pass and say hey come get you some because that just would have not been a game you know They've just there would have just been slaughter, so that that's about the no, the train. Train is kind of you know it's it's all right, it's all right. There's nothing nothing all inspiring about it, but I did like the fact that you could uh, move it or remove a piece of terrain. Ah, choosing the scenario. Now this is where your strategy rating is coming in. Where if your strategy rating where you won initiative, you can pick your scenario. So, but what I did on mine, because I was playing a solo game, I kind of mixed and matched a few of the items here. If you notice that in the pitch battle, you got flank march, hidden ambush, and unacceptable losses as you're there, kind of like, like sub scenarios of the pitched battle, you know, that you can kind of uh, choose from. I went ahead and I used flank march, but I also had a river, if you notice, if you, if you looked at the battle report, uh, a river crossing, and also we uh, employed the unacceptable losses. And that, you know, I chose a little cut bit of combination, but if you notice here on the left, this is the ones they had in the book for each one, escalating engagement, you have reserves, unacceptable, random game length, uh, meeting engagement, and river crossing. Um, I used a kind of a combination of these things. I would stick strictly to the letter of the law in the book but that's uh well, you can do that when you're solo gaming <laughs> you know there's there there's no harm no foul in that one okay let's talk about sequence of play 
The first phase that you come to is the orders phase. This is standard I've, in all big battle games. You've got you've got a list of things that you start off with. You you declare your charge, your charge response, and stuff like that, and rally your troops and all this sort of thing. But let's look at over here on the on the right hand side some of the things I I liked. The options for the charge response: stand, stand and fire, evade, fire and evade, flee, fire and flee. And one of the most interesting is the cavalry counter charge. Now, what I like about this game is that it does not allow every unit to do everything. So strategically, there are some units that can uh, evade, fire and evade, and fire and flee. And there are other units, their only options are to stand and fire. And those are normally uh, restricted to your um, your close order infantry and um, that sort of thing. And, and then with these different options, then certain troop types could become much more viable to you in deciding your army makeup. Uh, declare and execute tactical withdrawals. I love this. I really do. I think it's wonderful. I think um, it's been such a long time since I've played Hail Caesar. It's really starting to aggravate me that uh, uh, I do believe that's in there too. That in some instances your cavalry can choose to disengage. I think that's a wonderful rule. Obviously the rallying the broken troops. Then you have to check the morale. And what I like about this system is that it's different in this phase than in when you're checking during the combat phase. In this phase, this this means this, these units have been they're already fleeing. And so, if somebody's fleeing, you know, a quarter of the battlefield away, you don't have to check for them. This this is a very close. I mean, ten centimeters is what, about four inches. You know, about four inches, and uh, so you don't have to worry about it being too long of a check. I do like that. Um, check for imp impetuous or reckless troops. I didn't have anything like that, but I'm sure that if you had like a large Gaelic war bands and stuff like that, that could come into play. And I do believe a lot more games are uh, have have placed that in, and I'm I I'm okay with that one in here. The one thing I really like about this, if you have that reserves uh, scenario in like pitched battle and stuff like that that once they come onto the table if they're close enough they can go ahead and declare a charge but come on because they come on but they come on the table at the beginning of your movement phase so they do have a chance to declare charges or or, or on in your orders phase and then you can declare charge with them in the movement phase Okay, movement phase. Okay, move your impetuous and reckless troops. Obviously, yeah. That what I really like about this is the the run amok thing. I've always I've always loved that in a game where you've got that you know that elephant or the the chariot that's just wandering around the battlefield causing chaos. Um, Obviously, you know, moving your evading and fleeing troops. I like that. Um, you're standing and shooting. Uh, you're moving your chargers. And now we come to this intercept. This is your cavalry counter charge, basically. I do like that. Gives a, a little bit of flavor to it. Again, it's a tactical choice. I do like that. Uh, you move your generals. I like this that uh, you're like in Hail Caesar, your your generals and your sub commanders just make your units better. They're not these grand heroic characters running about the battlefield slaying foes left and right. Um, very historical in that sense. Shooting phase. Very standard stuff. We've we've seen this all the time. Declare your target, check your range. Now, obviously, uh, 
declaring your targets, there's no pre-measuring here. This goes back to a much older system in which you don't pre-measure. And so if you're out of range, then you're out of range and you're kind of just out of luck there. But if you are in range, you check your line of sight and, and you, you know you check your ranges and apply the modifiers and roll the hit. One of the things that I like most about this game, and like and and like some other games, they they roll to hit and then you know you roll to wound and then you take your armor checks. I like this where you roll to hit, you take your armor checks, you take away the hits because that's basically what your armor does. It deflects the, the incoming blow. And then those that get through, you roll to kill. I, I just like that process. It, it, I don't know, it, in my head, that seems to be a much more realistic portrayal of what, um, if you can think of it as realistic, it just seems like a, a much better sequence to use. Hand-to-hand -hand phase. A determining strike order. Now, this is a little different. Um, obviously, if you uh, are chargers, you go first. But after you have these ongoing combats, then it's the higher hand-to-hand -hand skill that goes first. Uh, that kind of replaces the old concept of um, in these and some other game systems. I won't mention them, but... They used what was called an initiative to declare who would go first or second and it depended on weapons type and all that kind of stuff. This this takes all that out of it. Again, hey, you rolled a hit and then the armor checks, like I mentioned before, I do like that. Um, you know, re removing the casualties. Okay, now this is, this is the bugaboo about the game for me. It is a model removal system. And I will talk about that in the conclusion. What I, well, what sort of options might be available to us to make this part of it a little bit better? But overall, I am not a fan of model removal in mass battle games and skirmish games where you're you're playing very small, where maybe you have anywhere from ten to maybe thirty models on the table. It makes sense. And that to keep track of that that makes it, each model has a very significant role upon the table in mass battle games i don't think it's necessary and it's one of the things that i think that hail caesar got extremely right uh, i do like the um, combat resolution where there's a lot a lot of um, extras that go into it uh, one of the things like uh, can you can get a bonus for defending a wall Instead of it being some sort of uh, negative to your opponent's ability to strike you or increasing your saves and stuff like that, it's just a, a, a combat resolution sort of bonus. I like that. You know, like if you're charging downhill, like it's the you know, riverbanks. I do like that. That's that. That's a plus for me. The combat outcome. Phase. This is one after you've done all the combat and you got to do all your checks and all that kind of stuff, you know. Uh, this is where um, if a unit is broken in combat and it's fleeing, this is where you check at the 20, 25 centimeter mark, which is basically, how, how long is that? Is that like, like eight inches? 25 centimeters? Uh, I went through this whole game in centimeters. You'd think I would know. No, 25, 25, uh, almost uh, 22 inches. So that's a long way. But that's different than if they are ongoing fleeing. So a little different. But I don't mind it. But that gives you a chance to, like, if you have a real stubborn line, you might be able to get a couple of units to break. Um, then you move them. Uh, one of the things I do like, if you look here to the right, it's got fleeing or pushed back. That is an option. And I do believe that is an option also in Hail Caesar. Again, forgive me, it's been a while since I've played Hail Caesar, but uh, which is my fault basically. 
uh, you can pursue, you can hold in advance on your uh, uh, as the winning side. I like that. You don't have to do just one thing or the other. Uh, fighting withdrawals. I like this idea. I, I like the concept of a fighting withdrawal for certain types of troops. You know, it's just one of those things where it gives you a tactical option. You, you just, um, you're just not going to lose your light cavalry or your fast moving troops uh, just because they wound up getting involved in a combat with something and they can't get out of it. Especially, you know, like it's really when cavalry is against um, infantry. You know, and I think that's a that's a wonderful little addition. Um, then you go and you reorder your unengaged units. That means you might want to change your formation before you start your next turn. Or you know, like in, in my uh, solo war gaming project, in one turn I actually took a unit of Greek infantry from Phalanx formation and just extended it. Now they lost their Phalanx formation, but they were still fighting in two ranks because they have long, long spears. But that was to keep them from getting charged in the flank. And so I thought that was a, a tactically uh, viable option for them. And so I did that in the game. And then you can reorder your engaged units, which you can begin to overlap. And overlap is another one of those things I I just find has kind of fallen by the wayside in a lot of big battle games. And it's where you uh, begin to bring more and more of your troops into the fight as you win. You don't you're not just stuck with the same number of guys. Like if I have a five man front and I charge in and okay, I get, in the first turn I can see you getting five. Say I say I win. Well, more of my guys can't push forward. I've always thought it was, you know, yeah, you, know, you don't want everybody just lapping around and, and stuff like that. But you want to be able to bring in additional troops because that comes in very handy, like for like a war band or something like that that really needs to have that early win. So that's, I think this is a, a really nice little addition. In conclusion, do I like the pace of play? Both yes. And no, it's your standard you go, I go, and um, it allows for a lot of thinking uh, up front. It can be um, a slow and ponderous thing, I can see, because a lot of the games that have been like this before were, were that way at times, depending on your, your, your opponent, how, how they like to play and how many how how long they agonize over a decision uh do i like model remover system i've already mentioned it but no but in one little caveat i would say that if you have multi-based models and where you got like four to eight guys on a base that would make it a lot better where you were taking off big chunks rather than small chunks i would prefer some other sort of counting system rather than pulling off my model because I'll have to tell you when going through this solo war game thing I broke more spears picking them up pulling them off because I've got a lot of my stuff magnetized for transportation and you pick it up wrong and it, it they would snap and come off and then you're fixing stuff and so I've I would like to use this system but only if my models were based on larger bases and then for therefore like if i if i lose three guys and i got them base four to a base i put a, a red thing down and then if i go over that then i'll just take them take the whole base off something along those lines do i like the feel of the game yes i like the feel of the game i like some of the tactical options the fighting withdrawals the um, uh, cavalry counter charge and those sort of additional pieces in the game really kind of sing out to me. And would I recommend this rule set? I think overall, yes. But like with all rules, sometimes 
they need to be adjusted for the time period in which we find ourselves playing. And I think this one suffers that. Uh, I like the big battle games. I'm a, I prefer, if I'm going to spend time playing a game, I want to play something that, that, that feels like it's got magnitude to it. I'm not a big fan of a lot of skirmish games. I, I like skirmish games if their effect is going to affect, if their results are going to affect a big battle game, that they are connected somehow. That's whatever happens in that small skirmish game for, I don't know, supplies or, 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 or some sort of, uh, like some sort of an assassination attempt on some sort of heroic character or leadership, or it has some sort of an effect on the big, then I'm all for them. As standalone games, they're okay. They're okay. I like, I like things that have this uh, symmetry to them, that there is some sort of overall connection between when we're playing the small games and the big games and the small games lead to the big games and the and and they have this interconnectedness over time uh i would recommend this set to to, to guys that like big battles their their um their army for less term their army books the the let's see what is it uh it's the rise and fall of persia Oh, Kingdom of Heaven for uh, the Crusades, and what is it? something, oh, I had to reach over and grab the book, Age of Ravens is what it's called for like the, the Vikings period, Dark Age sort of material. But that's my uh, little review of this. I hope it helps if anybody's on the fence, uh, I hope it... Uh, Lends an option. Perhaps you can find them on eBay. I've got all four of the books, and they're very well done. I mean, I have no problem with it. It's just, it's just this this rule set suffers from its um, the time that it's in, and I think it is a viable option for those who like big battle games. Um, and there are so many options out there. If you've got the one that you like, then that's fine. But if you don't have one, take a look at it. If you, you know, but again, it comes down to what's your group playing. Are you? Are, are would they be open-minded to it? Are they familiar with it? It's a very familiar system. Once you get into it, you'll go, oh, okay, this reminds me of such and such. And yeah, there there's certain elements in there, but there's also certain elements in this that give it its own flavor. But hey, I really appreciate you guys sticking in with this. Uh, that's that's as far as this review is going to go. Um, I liked it. I like a lot of the little subplot options in there that, you know, some of these, these options, uh, strategic options, I should say, within the game itself. Um, if anybody else has, has used this, has played this and wants to leave a comment, I really would appreciate it. Um, just stay in contact. Let me know what you think. If you haven't subscribed, subscribe. If you want to uh, leave a comment down below, if you think I'm just full of crap and I've missed the mark, you let me know about it. I can take it. Uh, everybody, just have a wonderful, wonderful uh, holiday. Uh, it is here in the States anyway. And... I will see you next time.